Greetings, Bethlehem Lutheran Church, and welcome to this, our service for the first Sunday of Christmas. Merry Christmas. We begin this service as we always do in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Shine into our hearts the light of your wisdom, O God, and open our minds to the knowledge of your word, that in all things we may think and act according to your good will, living continually in the light of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> lesson comes from the prophet Isaiah, the ninth chapter, beginning in the second verse. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness on them, light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, and all authority rests upon his shoulders. And he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And his authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace. For the throne of David and his kingdom, he will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time onward and forevermore, for the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his host. Praise him, sun and moon. 
Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Gloria, Then praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind, fulfilling his command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Kings of the earth and all peoples, Princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. Glory. Epistle lesson today is Titus, chapter 2, beginning in the 11th verse. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. <laughs>
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter, beginning in the 41st verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Now every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. And when the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among the relatives and friends, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. And then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Merry Christmas, Bethlehem. Welcome again to the first Sunday of Christmas. It's wonderful to be standing here. Just two nights earlier, we were gathered in this space with lit candles to announce the advent of our God, to inaugurate the feast of the Nativity, the birth of God's Messiah. And yet now, according to today's gospel lesson, the infant Christ child is all grown up in two days' time. One moment the angels are heralding his coming and the shepherds receiving that heavenly birth announcement, and the next we have a 12-year-old kid on our hands. It is jarring for sure. But as every parent knows, it's also true. In the blink of an eye, your baby is all grown up. Something like this is going on in Luke chapter 2 when Mary and Joseph find their son deliberating with the learned teachers in the temple and hear, perhaps for the first time, that for Jesus, his father's house is not the family lineage of his father Joseph, but the temple to the Lord God Almighty, the temple which Christ will assume in his person. For indeed, in his body, his flesh and blood, the presence of the Almighty draws near to us. In his flesh and blood, the invisible God is made visible. Mary, did you know we sing? And the answer is, of course she knew, and Joseph did too. The angels, the prophecies, the dreams, the evidence of their own eyes, they knew, knowing wasn't the issue. Accepting, that's the hard part. See, Mary and Joseph had raised Jesus for this moment. Jesus beginning to differentiate himself from his family, stepping out in his own authority to do his own listening, to take control of his own learning. Parents spend all their time preparing their ch children to enter the world to make a go of it on their own, and yet when the time comes, it's not so easy. That's where we find Mary and Joseph in today's lesson. Coming to term with their son's emerging vocation. And maybe they aren't the only ones who begin to feel a little bit like outsiders or bystanders. As Jesus grows in wisdom and in stature and in favor, in some ways he can feel less relatable to us. Babies we get. Their needs, their demands are simple. But Jesus is on his way to becoming a miracle worker, 
a learned teacher, a wise prophet, priest, and king, can we really relate to those vocations? This is why I so appreciate our little glimpse of the Holy Family in Luke's Gospel. They become our entry point into this strange and wonderful story of the advent of our God in the flesh. The story of our redemption from sin, death, the devil, and the world. It is they who first nurture and guide our Lord. It is they who first suffer and sacrifice and struggle on his behalf. And I say that the Holy Family becomes our entry point into the salvation story, not just because their joys and griefs are relatable, but because all who are baptized into Christ's body don't just have God for their heavenly father, but they have Mary and Joseph for their spiritual parents and all the saints of God as siblings in Christ. So that Christ's holy family becomes our holy family. Biblical theologian Scott Hahn makes this claim in his little book, Joy to the World, in which he notes that the Christmas story offers us an unconventional hero. Not a, war a warrior, not a worldly conqueror, not an individual at all, but rather a family. He writes, we see the swaddling bands, and we know they're for a baby, but someone had to do the swaddling. We read of the child's exile in Egypt, but someone had to take him there. Someone had to protect him from brigands along the desert roads, and someone had to work hard to support the mother and the baby in a foreign land. Yes, Jesus is at the center of the drama, he continues, but he doesn't behave like a conventional hero. He doesn't fit the classical model. He's not acting alone. He's not intruding himself to change the course of events. In fact, he's hardly acting at all. He's passive, nursed and placed to sleep in a manger found on his mother's lap by the Magi, carried away in flight to Egypt. Like any baby, he exercises a powerful attraction, drawing love from those who draw near, yet he is visible only because other arms are holding him. Scott Hahn continues. So Jesus did not come into this world alone. He came into this world by way of a family, and he brought us salvation so that we could share membership in the family of God. That's the very meaning of salvation and the meaning of Christmas. John chapter 1, verse 12, but to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God. Scott Hahn's beautiful reminder here is that at the heart of the Christmas story, we find three beating hearts. The Christ child, yes, but also the bleary-eyed mother who hasn't had enough sleep and the stressed-out father wondering how he will afford a new mouth to feed. And furthermore, that holy family is the same one we meet today, 12 years later, still worried about their son, reflecting on all that has occurred and yet not ready for what is still to come. In light of the burdens and the blessings of parenthood, theologian Carrie Frost writes this. She says, the ascent to a new human being is an act of hope. The hope that this child will grow and flourish. The hope that the world will be safe and kind to this child. The hope that this child will know the truth and the goodness in the world. The hope that this child will know God. This hope is, of course, tinged with darkness and sadness. For the world will not always be safe, she writes, and it will not always be kind to our children. They will suffer and our hearts will ache over this suffering, as did Mary's. For to be born is to be condemned to suffering and to death. But childbearing involves an appreciation for the new. 
and the accompanying hope that what is true and good about human life is larger than its darkness or sadness. And then Carrie Frost concludes, Christmas is all about celebrating newness of life. Or as she puts it, we remember that Mary did something new. She contained the uncontainable. She created her creator. She was the burning bush unconsumed. She ushered God into time, flesh, and human experience on Christmas, and her son was something new. Jesus Christ uniting the divine and the human within himself, something that had never happened before in the history of the world. And then Carrie Frost gives this wonderful line. She says, there are indeed new things under the sun, S-O-N. What is it that ties these new things together? Family, the holy family, the family of God called to support and accompany one another, to rejoice with one another in seasons of rejoicing and to sorrow in seasons of sorrowing. We've spent the past four weeks of Advent anticipating this Christmas, waiting for the coming of Christ, looking back in faith, looking forward in hope, and looking around in love. But what does Christ tell his family, tell us today? He says, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Last weekend, my son Luke spent nearly seven hours with me at church between John Collins' funeral and Sunday worship. And as we were driving to the ferry Sunday afternoon, I acknowledged that we hadn't had much one-on-one -on -one time because of daddy's church work, and I thanked Luke for being patient, and he said to me, I love to be in the Lord's house with my daddy. Why were you searching for me? Our Lord asks us. Don't you know that I must be in the house of the Lord? Sisters and brothers in Christ, this isn't just a statement of fact. This is a promise to you and to me that Christ may be found in the fellowship of ice fishermen angling for crappie or walleye in a frozen lake in Minnesota. Christ may be found in a warm hug or the company of quilters or words of encouragement and acts of kindness and the beauty of a sunset or a good book, but the mystery of God's grace is such that Christ may be found in all of these places, but where Christ promises always to be is here in his church where he's bound himself to his word and his sacrament the audible and the tangible signs of his love for us his very words entrusted to our ears and our hearts his very body and blood entrusted to our hands as surely as his words and his flesh were entrusted to the ears and the hands of that first holy family, especially Mary, the mother of God, who not only cradled her newborn king and worshipped this seven pound, six ounce God come in the flesh, but who took everything in and pondered, treasured them in her heart. Thank God she did that because she then passed it on to Luke, who set it all down for us in his gospel, so that we too might treasure God's word in our hearts and cling to the promise that where the Father is, there Christ will be also, and Christ will always be found here, in the Lord's house, among the assembly of the baptized, who trust in Jesus for our salvation. That's part of it. And the other part is this, because we are simultaneously saint and sinner. We're not just the baptized, we are also those who wander and err. We are those who are prone to stumbling and losing our way. And so today, we hear these words, we receive them anew with faith, and we express our love for the Lord, and we ask his help that we, we as well may always be found where he is always found.
in the house of the Lord. Merry Christmas. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and the redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Joining our voices with the heavenly host the angels, the saints, and martyrs of the church throughout time and space. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need, responding with, receive our prayer. You come to us in gatherings of your church across the globe. Unite us, O Lord, with those who celebrate your birth, even when they are weighed down by grief, loss, poverty, hunger, or injustice. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You come to us in the diverse splendor of the creation on this planet and throughout the cosmos. Grant us the humility to accept our place in the natural world, but also the dignity to embody our role as caretakers of all that you have made in us and around us. Merciful God, you come to us through relationships of many kinds, families, friends, communities, nations. Guide us in our conduct, that we would recognize Christ in one another and show you love, especially showing your love to those most vulnerable. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You come to us through people whom the world forgets, poor shepherds and an imprisoned Paul, announcing your good news. Send your spirit to all who are imprisoned, struggling with addiction, unwell, or in any need this day, especially those whom we name aloud or silently in our hearts at this time. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You come to us in acts of justice and forgiveness. May we acknowledge our sin, turn from it in repentance, and receive each day your promise of forgiveness. Supply us with the wisdom to be clothed with love, binding all things together in perfect harmony. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You come to us through those who have died yet live with you forever. We give thanks for St. Stephen this day, deacon and martyr, who gave his life to tell the story of your love. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Rejoicing in your word made flesh among us, we commend these prayers to you, confident of your grace and love made known to us in Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.
bless you and keep you, make his face to shine on you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Merry Christmas.